Okay, uh, Golden Dain, Jaeger, Isaac Kato. Uh, good morning. My name is Isaac Kato. That's about the extent of my Icelandic. I have no slides today, so uh, you're going to have to look at uh, my my ugly mug in two places the whole time. I'm sorry. Um, uh, and uh, I see, as usual, the the uh, podiums here are Icelandic size. So one of these years, I'll remember to bring a footstool. But uh, I don't like to walk around actually. Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, Trigvi and Mary, uh, those were amazing stories. I'm, I'm so inspired. I, I love what you guys are doing. It's just incredible. Um, so uh, let's see. I, uh, I had the distinct honor and pleasure back in 2012 to uh, tell the Vern Global founder story, or really the first half or third of the Vern Global founder story. Uh, and Bala, thank you so much for, for having me back. So here we are 10 years later. I know there were at least a couple people in the audience who um, who were there. Ted, I know you were there. Anybody else at the first? The very first? Oh, Pi Paula. OK. Oh, there are a few. OK. So, so some of you have actually heard this. Um, in fact, uh, if you go on YouTube, you can you can see the video of my uh, the first uh, founder story. I think there are something like uh, 120 views or something. I think there's 121 now because I watched it again before before doing this. But um, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to actually uh, fill you in and update you on what's happened, uh, what's happened since. Um, Quick, a quick word on on, uh, on my uh, um, on my personal background. Um, I am a serial entrepreneur, so I've started two companies. I've run three of them. I've raised a couple hundred million dollars of, of of money for my companies along the way, and all three of my companies have had successful exits. Um, but I've also been a longtime investor, so I was a, a professional venture capitalist for about 12 years. Um, spent many years at a place called General Catalyst Partners, which some of you may know. It's a big global venture fund. Uh, and then for the last few years, I've been running uh, one of the one of the big accelerator programs, uh, Techstar Seattle, as well as our one of our crypto accelerators. So I've had the great opportunity to work with uh, now dozens and dozens of startup companies to try to help them on um, on their zero to one journey. Um, let me get a quick contextual check here. So okay, I know there are a bunch of a uh, bunch of founders in the room. How many startup founders are here again? Okay, good number. Okay, great. How many people are Icelandic? Okay, quite a few. And um, uh, how many people are under 27? OK, so this is going to be like ancient dinosaur history for you all. Uh, I'll, try to, I'll try to provide some, some context. Um, and sorry, really quickly, does, how many people know about Vern Global? Just OK. OK, OK, so there are a few people. All right, great. OK, so um, here we go. Vern Global, part two. Uh, it's still going, by the way, so maybe in 10 years, Bala, you can have someone at the current team come and give, give an update. Um, so my first, uh, my first introduction to Iceland uh, goes back to May of 2006, which was the first time I set foot here on, uh, on the island. Um, uh, you know, one of the, uh, yeah, I set foot here on the island, and uh, I was, at the time, I was a venture capitalist. I was with, with General Catalyst Partners, and what brought me here was, I had been looking for a very specific type of video game company to invest in, uh, specifically massively multiplayer online role-playing games. Uh, and one of the best ones in the world was uh, created and uh, developed and, and published here by a company called CCP Games. Uh, and th their game is called EVE Online. They just celebrated their 20th anniversary of being live. It's an amazing phenomenon. And I actually was on the board of that company for 12 years until it was acquired by a big Korean uh, developer in 2018. Um, so. I had met uh, the CEO, Hilmar Pietersen, who many of you may know, and uh, uh, co-founder Rainier Hardison, and I was just blown away by these guys. And so I came over uh, to try to invest in the company, and to make a long story short, uh, I led our investment in, uh, in 2006 in CCP Games. Uh, yeah, but I, and so I started coming here on business for board meetings, and I just quickly fell in love with Iceland. I was captivated by the people, by the place. I just, uh, I, I thought it was one of the most unique and amazing places in the world, and I still think that. And uh, I've now probably been to Iceland well over 200 times. For 10 years, I came here twice a month. Uh, I've also brought my family here for 14 summers, so we have this weird, intimate connection with Iceland. Uh, my daughter speaks pretty uh, passable Icelandic, in fact, uh, uh, which is, you got to understand, it's really strange for an American, you know, 17-year-old who's never lived here to speak Icelandic, but she, she loves it so much. So, uh, so anyway, Iceland just grabbed me by the throat uh, in 2006, and it's never let go. Uh, probably uh, nine months... <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, after we invested in uh, CCP, uh, Hilmar, the CEO, pulled me aside and said, "Hey, Isaac, 
You guys ought to think about building data centers here in Iceland. And for me, it was the proverbial lightning bolt just striking me. I thought immediately, oh my God, what a great idea. I, I had looked at some data center investment opportunities in the United States. I, I had seen what uh, Google and Microsoft were doing uh, in the Columbia River Gorge in Washington State. So what they had done was built very, very large data centers uh, to take advantage of the low-cost hydroelectric power that was available there. And you know, the, the parallel was immediate, immediately obvious. And it had been you know, around here, at least academically, for a while. But Iceland <clears throat> could be, uh, to Western Europe, what, what that was to, to the United States. Uh, Iceland, as, if you don't know, I think most people know this by now, if you've been, even the executive MBAs have probably heard this a million times in the week you've been here, but Iceland has uh, extremely low cost, uh, but 100% renewable electricity, uh, which makes it really quite a unicorn. And even back in 2000, this is now kind of spring of 2007, back then it was acutely clear that power was quickly becoming the biggest problem that most data centers faced, getting a hold of, of, of uh, of low-cost power and I preferably renewable power um, and at the time there was a big clean tech boom going on uh, so if you built a data center here you would build one of the most not only economically efficient but environmentally efficient data centers in the world and you would both reduce a bunch of costs for your customers but you would also really help them reduce uh, their carbon footprint related to their computing and you know even then I think the electricity consumption in the U.S., 2% uh, of it was going to data centers. So it's, it's, a, it's a lot. So the, the power of the idea immediately just grabbed me. And um, so I went, to, uh, I went to my partners at General Catalyst, and I went to our local uh, co-investor in CCP, a group called Novator, and said, hey, what do you all think about, uh, what do you all think about building uh, a, a green data center business in Iceland? And everybody loved the idea. So uh, in... July of 2007, I signed the incorporation papers for, for Vern Global. Uh, it was called Project Vern back then. And um, we really set it up to just sort of test and validate the idea. So we, we put a little bit of seed money in. Uh, I spent probably half my time <clears throat> working on this idea. And um, I, I was the uh, executive vice chairman of Vern Global. And we had a, a great Icelandic chairman, a fellow named uh, Billy Thorsteinson, you've already seen his picture a couple times, but if you don't know, if you're, if you're an entrepreneur here, you should definitely know Billy. Uh, and uh, so, you know, two, two big things we did. I, um, I did a lot of the 2007 version of, of customer discovery. Uh, this was before the Lean Startup had actually come out. So, uh, but, I, but I talked to a bunch of p potential customers about uh, whether or not this idea was something they might be interested in. And um, uh, I remember distinctly going into the office of the head of Internet uh, architecture at one of the biggest uh, global investment banks and commercial banks actually in the world and more or less, I sat down and more or less before I opened my mouth the guy says to me listen Isaac six months ago I told my team that the best place in the world to build a power intensive data center was in Iceland so if you build it we're gonna come I'm like oh okay I'll just be quiet I'll take that order right now and so we got really really strong signal that there would be demand for what we were doing uh, if we proceeded uh, but the other thing that we quickly realized is uh, the only way that we were going to be able to get, get an industry going here if uh, we got another submarine cable laid. So at the time, there was only one fiber optic cable connecting or modern connect cable connecting Iceland to the rest of the world. It uh, came from here down into Dunnet Bay in Scotland. And there's a concept of redundancy in data center design. So you always want to have redundant systems. And if there weren't at least two cables, uh, no serious customer was going to put their mission critical data in a place like Iceland. So Billy and I spent the next, I don't know, nine, 12 months chasing around the Icelandic government to try to convince them to lay a second cable. And in the end, after quite, a, quite, a, quite an interesting trip, uh, uh, they agreed to invest $80 million to lay Danice, which was the second big cable uh, connecting Iceland into Denmark. By the way, they're now, they're now four cables, as many of you know. So uh, the Iris system just went live, which is incredible. I think it'll do really good things for Iceland and, and for the data center industry here. Um, but more bandwidth always brings more, more data. Once the government had made that commitment, we felt, OK, this, this idea is going to fly. Um, if we build it, we're going to get customers. <clears throat> so we put, uh, put our first real round of money into the company. We put in $12 million. We bought uh, two large warehouses out on the uh, former NATO Naval Air Station in Keplavik, uh, 20,000 square meters, which is 200,000 square feet, roughly. It's a lot of space, and we were going to renovate those, those spaces and, and convert them into data centers. We signed big power contracts with Landsverken, the, the national power company, and we signed a big uh, uh, bandwidth contract with Far Ice. 
Uh, and we brought on a rock star team of a CEO and a CTO, Jeff Monroe and Tate Cantrell, who had built a, a very large, successful data center business in Iceland and loved this idea. So we had some real experts as well. And then they said, Isaac, we think you should be the CFO. And uh, I said, absolutely, this is my baby. If I don't do this, I will spend the rest of my life wondering you know, well, why I didn't. And so, so I jumped on. And so I started on July 1st of 2008. Jeff and Tate started roughly around the same time. And um, in what had to be one of the best examples of utterly horrible timing ever, what happened in October of 2008? Okay. The, the global financial meltdown, the CREPA. And, uh, in, uh, in, in October of 2008, uh, the, the world just melted down, as I think most people know. Uh, but it, you know, it started with first with Lehman Brothers collapsing, one of the biggest banks collapsed. But Iceland was just behind Lehman Brothers in the tip of the spear. And, uh, and, because, and, and in one week, all three of the big banks collapsed. And you know, the rest of the world viewed Iceland as almost like a failed state. The financial system was in complete disarray. Here, nobody knew what was going on. I mean, there were, people were understandably quite panicked. And, um, and you know, our really, really great idea, which everybody loved uh, in September of 2008, all of a sudden was a, like a joke. It was a complete goat of an idea. And uh, you know, it, it, it was horrifying. Uh, we actually kept on going. We had some momentum that carried us through kind of the early part of 2009 because we had a big customer who had signed an LOI. Uh, so we thought, look, if they're going to go forward with this, we can build the data center and, uh, and get into business. But of course, as things here got weirder and weirder, uh, that fish got loose on the hook and then slipped away. And so at that point, we realized uh, we're, we're really, really in deep trouble. So uh, we had to go into sort of cockroach survival mode. Uh, we let go two thirds of the team. Uh, all of us took you know, major pay cuts. We cut our costs down to the bare minimum and we just said, look, we just got to survive until we figure out what to do. And um, the next, I could talk for hours about what happened over the next few years, but they, they sucked. The next, the next few years were utterly horrible. Um, we, 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 um, we, had to, we had to do, we had a lot of hard conversations. We had to restructure. All of our contracts, and 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 at the time, even if we found someone who was interested in in putting their servers and their data in Iceland, inevitably the chief re risk officer the, or the CFO would say, "Are you kidding me? Read the papers. Iceland's on fire." Okay, you can't, you can't do that. And uh, uh, and I, you know, I have I'd have tough conversations like uh, we before the crash happened, we'd ordered and put down a deposit on three million dollars worth of backup generators. The data centers are very capital intensive, if you don't know. And sometime in 2009, the CFO of that company calls me and says, hey, uh, Isaac, uh, you know those generators you ordered? They're here. Why don't you come and pick them up and uh, pay us the balance? And, and I had to say, well, you know, we're not quite ready to take those. Would you mind holding on to those uh, for us for a little while? We'll, we'll pay you a service fee. We'll pay you, you know, interest, whatever. But we can't really take them right now. And of course, he knew what was going on. Nobody in Iceland was feeling good at the time. Uh, nobody needed any extra generators at the time. So he held on to him. And, uh, and uh, every few months, he would call me and say, hey, Isaac, you want those generators now? And I'd say, yeah, we're not quite ready, but we, we, we will take them someday soon, I, I hope. Uh, and um, so we had a lot of conversations like that. But um, you know, I've often asked myself now, well, why, why didn't we quit? Okay, why, you know, I mean, no one would have faulted us for saying, "Hey, this is just too hard. <laughs> We're going to call it a day." Uh, you know, the, the world just collapsed. The idea is blown. But but we didn't. And you know, I think there are a few reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, and this is a big part of being a founder, we had total commitment to this idea. We firmly believed in our vision and in the mission, and that. Uh, you know, there was going to be growing demand for data centers, which there has been, uh, that we had one of the best value propositions in the industry, and that sooner or later, all this perceived risk around Iceland would, would eventually go away, and, and we would do great things for, for our customers and um, for the industry. And so we, we really believed. That was one thing. Uh, number two, over the, over the time that we've been working together, the team had really gelled. We really liked working together. We had a huge amount of trust and respect for each other. It was a really extraordinary team, and, and we liked being together. Um, and then I think the third thing is just temperamentally, uh, none, of the, none of the co founders and, and the, the team that had stayed are quitters by nature. Like, we, we are all very competitive, we all hate losing. 
And so to just give up on this thing, especially after so many people had entrusted, had given us their trust, their money in many cases, had t- you know taken a big bet on us, to just walk away it would would not have not have been right. So we kept on going, and we we struggled through the next uh, the next few years. We restructured all our contracts. We um, uh, we had to get a a law passed to harmonize Iceland the Icelandic VAT code with the rest of the EU's because it wasn't harmonized. And it created a real problem for the business case. Um, that was a huge, huge, huge battle and a saga in its own right. Um, <clears throat> we um, continued to sell. It didn't help that in 2010, AF Atlético blew up. So there's a big volcano here. We lost a really big customer prospect thanks to the volcano. He was he was supposed to fly. So during the during the volcano, you, you had a hard time. The smoke generally blew to the southeast, so you couldn't get here from Europe too easily a lot of the time. But you could usually fly here from the U.S., and this customer was coming to do due diligence and check out the site. And, the, and he, he was going to fly to Boston, meet our CEO, fly over. And the day that he did it, the, sm- the direction of the wind shifted, and the smoke was blowing to the U.S., and he couldn't come. So that sort of killed that idea. He went back to, to Texas with his tail in between his legs. It was, we had stuff like that happen all the time. It was horrible. And I'm, and I'm not even scratching the surface about how bad it was. But it was bad for everybody here, right? But... You know what? We we still had belief in the idea, and so by the beginning of 2011, 2011, we cleaned everything up we could, but we realized we weren't going to be able to sell an empty shell of a building to customers. We really needed to have a product that was up and running to get people into the data center. So we went to our our existing investors, and then there was a new investor that had showed up and started to take attention, a group called the Welcome Trust, which is one of the biggest uh, charitable trusts in the UK. And we said, look, Team, folks, we've done everything we can to clean this up. We still believe in the idea, but unless we build something, it can be a smaller version of what we originally envisioned, envisioned this, isn't, this isn't gonna fly and we should wrap it up. Uh, but if you, guys, if you guys wanna keep on going, we need to raise some more money and then we'll, we'll go ahead. And they said, well, you folks have been terrific. You, uh, you didn't give up. You could have abandoned us. Uh, and we still like the idea too, so let's do it. Let's move forward. So in Early 2011, we recapitalized the company. We brought in uh, $20 million of fresh capital uh, led by the Wellcome Trust, and we got to work. And in um, spring of 2012, which is a month or two before I last spoke here, we opened for business. And uh, you know, we were on such a high. I can't tell you how good that felt to just start the company. Small little one megawatt data hall, but, but it was real, and we had a handful of customers. And from there, things just started to go. They started to take off. I actually moved to London because uh, all of our customers and investors were European uh, for the most part. And then uh, not long after that, we, we acquired our first big enterprise customer, which was BMW, which was hugely validating because if, if this is good enough for BMW, it's good enough for a lot of people. So over the next uh, ensuing years, we got Volkswagen. We got a couple of uh, big financial services companies. Um, we had a really big breakout year in 2014 because in 2013 I, I, I encountered this thing called Bitcoin mining, which happens to work really well here, and I brought the miners, and they loved Iceland. I then spent the next few years cleaning up the mess that they created for us, but nonetheless they helped a lot, and we signed a huge you know, 10-year, $25 million enterprise contract, so we grew, I don't know, 500% that year, and uh, off the back of that we were able to raise a, a $100 million Series D led by Stepnir, which is a local private equity fund. And so um, things, things were going well. And uh, the company kept on growing steadily, as, as you know, any well-run data center does. And we brought more and more customers in. So uh, we get to uh, 2017. And I have now been at Vern for, for 10 years. And I've uh, moved to, my family to London. And uh, at that point in time, uh, I had to make a very hard, hard decision. And for both personal and professional reasons, I decided that it was time for me to step away from Vern. Uh, so my kids were starting high school. We felt like we wanted to go back home to the United States to be near some family. Um, and uh, you know, I'd never, I'd never been anywhere for, 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 uh, for 10 years. And I feel like my own learning had sort of started to slow down. I wasn't developing as fast. So, so after a lot of soul searching, I talked to my, 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 my team and said, look, I need, to, I need to step away. Gave a long six month kind of notice, and then at the end of 2017, I was my last day as an employee of Burn Global. And it was very hard. I'm leaving people who I love. Uh, this is, again, my baby. Uh, I, you know, I love Iceland, and uh, we're moving back to the west coast of the US. The other thing was, by the way, also, I had no idea if I would ever see a dime on my founder's equity at that point in time. 
but I wouldn't have traded the experience for anything. Uh, I mean, I, I learned so much. I developed so much personally and professionally. I made the best of friends. I, we accomplished things I never would have thought possible. Uh, so I had no regrets, but I also didn't think, ah, I don't know if I'll ever make any money on this. Um, and it was okay. Uh, so I moved back to the States. I actually was recruited to run a, an AI business in Seattle called Mighty AI, and that company actually got acquired by Uber. Uh, then I joined um, uh, Techstar Seattle and, and worked, uh, uh, which is, again, a really top-notch accelerator working with uh, startups. Uh, but there's a really nice coda to the Vern story, which is that in 2021, the company was actually acquired for 320 million bucks. So we actually did make a little bit of money, and, and that was a nice way to sort of put a bow on that. And the company's still here. It's still growing. It's now probably twice the size it was when I left. Um, it's now expanded outside of Iceland, but, but you know, we brought an industry to Iceland, and we feel really, really great about it. So I'm running out of time. I'm going to be really quick. Uh, I just want to share a couple, a couple key learnings uh, from my experience at Vern uh, that I hope uh, are you know, helpful to you. Uh, there, again, I could talk for hours about all the lessons from this, but the first thing I just want to say uh, that I've learned from both Vern and for all this, from all the startups that I work with is despite this age of AI, despite all the automation, uh, it always comes back to the people. Okay? Any major human endeavor, and certainly founders, come back to the people. And um, you, know, you have to learn a lot of things doing startups. You have to build product, you have to learn how to go to market, how to raise money if you're, raising, if you're, raising that, if you're going that route. Um, but what I think people need to do is actually really learn how to be great leaders. Because, and starting by leading yourself and then leading a team, but if you can recruit great people, if you can motivate them, if you can get them to work in a cohesive fashion, you'll accomplish great things. And by virtue of having a really great team at Vern, we, 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 we survived a whole heck of a lot of really, really terrible stuff. And um, so, you know, teach yourself to be a great leader. It, it's, it's, it's a lifelong journey. I've learned about it. I feel like I still learn about it every day myself, but, uh, but make that investment. Um, the next thing I just want to talk about is the importance of tenacity. I'm sure you hear it all the time, called tenacity, grit, determination. But boy, have I seen that so, so often the, the sole distinction between the winners and the losers, between the people who live and the people who die, at least you know, metaphorically, is whether or not they have that deep reserve to keep on walking when things really suck. Okay? Can they keep on putting one foot in front of the other, even though every, there's, everything's telling them to quit what they're doing? Um, but the people who do it, Often, you know, most of the time, they survive. They go on. You, you keep on walking in roughly the right direction. Sooner or later, you'll get to a place where you can catch your breath, have a drink of water, and then start running again. And that was certainly the case for us. So, you know, and that comes with commitment to the idea that you're doing. And the last thing is, quick word on uh, the distinction between fulfillment and happiness. So we all want happiness, right? And people talk a lot about finding happiness in your job. But I make a distinction between fulfillment and happiness because I think happiness, while it's important, and if you're unhappy all the time, it's not good, it's ephemeral. I can be really happy, and then I can smash my toe against a rock, and then I'm really unhappy. So happiness comes and goes. But fulfillment, that's a much longer lasting thing. And there's a real beauty and joy in doing hard, hard things and overcoming them. And again, that was the case with Vern. We did so many hard things. We lifted so many big rocks. But every time we did that and got through those challenges, we felt well. And the sense of fulfillment that I get from doing something like Vern, no one can ever take that away from me. So don't forget about fulfillment. So. Last thing I'm going to say is a little quick, quick announcement. Uh, I left Techstars late last year. I am starting a new uh, venture capital fund. I can't really talk that much about it, but I will definitely be investing in places like Iceland. So if you have a really cool early stage startup, I'd love to talk to you. Probably won't really get into business until later this year, but uh, I'd love to hear from you. So again, uh, thank you so much. Talk to you later. Uh, Alfram Island.